السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد I praise Allah the Almighty alone and I send this peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear viewers everywhere, welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda. And I would like to remind you with our contact information in the beginning. As usual, the phone numbers begins, begin with the area code 002 0238552482492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492492
50,000 years before he created the heavens and earth. Two, nothing can stop or change or alter the preordainment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three, no one knows what's going to happen to him or to her so that they can prevent the harm or uh, incur a benefit. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَادَ تَكْسِبُ غَدَا وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتُ to explain the meaning of this ayah of Surah Luqman after I take a few points. Salam alaikum. Sabah from Canada. Wa alaikum as-salam. How are you, sister? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum as-salam. Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. And how are you, Sheikh? I'm just fine. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feeki. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. I know that uh, when a woman experiences her monthly period, she is allowed to read the Quran. But uh, my question is a little different. If a woman who reads uh, uh, one juice of Quran every day. Now, uh, if she is reading when her monthly period starts and she is on her 14th juice, she normally stops reading and then when she takes the ghusar, then she starts again from the 15th. Uh, now, if she's in a monthly period, should she keep on reading 15, 16, 17 and just read, read on and then she finishes? What, did you understand my question? Uh, kind of, I understand that you say if a woman uh, pauses her regular word or sabaq due to the period, shall she continue from wherever yes. she stopped? Yeah, no, my question is, a woman is reading her Quran every day. Now she's on the 14th juz and she experiences a period. So she stops reading the Quran and then after she, uh, becomes, uh, she, takes, uh, she becomes clear from a period, she starts from the 15th para. So instead of doing that, even in her period, can she read the 15th and just continue if while she's in a period? She's not a teacher, she's not a student, just a regular housewife. Okay. Uh, I did mention repeatedly the difference of opinions in this regard, whether a woman is capable to read the Quran and recite the Quran uh, uh, aside from revising or memorizing teaching or learning while she's having the period and I said there is a difference of opinion and the best is only to limit reading the Quran for a woman during the menses to the previous cases if she is a student learning or memorizing or revising or if there is if she's a teacher she has to teach the Quran to come out of the difference of opinion between the scholars in this regard. Okay? So in this case, she may continue right after the period is over and she takes a bath, removing the measure impurity, resume reading for wherever she stopped. Thank you, Sister uh, Saba from Canada. Barakallahu feeki. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith which is narrated by Al-Imam Ahmad مَرَّدَّتْهُ طِيَرَتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرٍ أَوْ عَنْ حَاجَتِهِ فَقَدْ أَشْرَكَ This is very serious because this is something that many people uh, fall in. It means if somebody was about to do something then when he was leaving he was about to start his car so he saw a black crow or a black cat or he saw a person, whenever he sees him, he, has, he is pessimistic about him. So he says, you know what? I'd rather not travel today. It's a bad sign. What day is today? Oh my goodness, it is Friday the 13th. No way I'm not traveling. In this, not doing something that he was planning to do is an act of shirk. Why? It is not the black cat which would bring a bad omen to you. It is not the number or the person, or the object, which will change or alter the destiny which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have preordained for you. The ayah which I promised to explain its meaning by the end of Surah Luqman, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَادَا تَكْسِبُ غَدًا وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٌ تَمُودٍ These are five things pertaining the knowledge of the unseen. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَادَ تَكْسِبُ غَدَا وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُودَ The catch is in the last two. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَادَ تَكْسِبُ غَدَا No one knows what's going to happen tomorrow, whether for himself or herself or for others. 
or how much are you going to earn or lose tomorrow? وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيَّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٌ And no one knows in which land he or she will die and what time. And uh, Sulaiman السلام, had a guest. So the guest saw the angel of death. He was so frightened. So he ran to Sulaiman السلام, and said, O Prophet of Allah, please order the wind. Because Allah said that he made the wind subservient and subjected to Sulaiman. تَجْرِي بِأَمْرِهِ رُخَاءً حَيْثُ أصاب. So he said, order the wind to carry me to India. He was in Palestine. He said, why? He said, because I see the angel of death is gazing at me, towards me. So he did. And after the wind carried him to India, Sulaiman said to the angel of death, why did you frighten my guest? He said, I'm, I'm shocked because I have in the record, in the Qadr, in the preordainment that God dictated to me to take his soul in India right now. What he has been doing right here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this person ask Sulaiman salam to go to his destination where he was supposed to die. While he was somewhere else, thousands of miles away from his final uh, place of destiny uh, or uh, uh, where he was supposed to expire. Why? Because nobody knows. And the Prophet ﷺ was ordered in the Qur'an to say, I'm just a human being like you. Have I known the unseen? لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَّنِيَ السُّوءُ I would have collected, piled up all the goodness, because I know the unseen. If I have a screen that tells me which share is going to go up tomorrow, I would definitely purchase all the shares in this particular item. Borrow money to purchase it. But I don't know. These are all expectations. It may be right, it may be wrong. And I would have avoided every evil. But even Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was not given access to the knowledge of the unseen. So this is a very important fact that we have to keep uh, in mind. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed al-istikhara. To pray pertaining any serious matter to consult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether to do or not to do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um Nada from the KSA. Hello, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, sister? I have three questions, Sheikh. Yeah. Uh, my first question is, is it uh, permissible? Can I say, Hasbi Allah, ni'ma al-wakil wa ni'ma al-mawla wa ni'ma al-nasir in my sajda during prayer? My second question is, um, I heard it from somebody, even though I did not read it, somebody told me that according to a hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it, it is obligatory for a woman to cover her hair even during, even in her house, otherwise the um, malaika of Rahma will not enter that house. So uh, is it, uh, what is the authenticity of this hadith? No, there is no such hadith. A woman yeah. may uh, cover or not cover her hair at home because covering of the aura uh, other than the major aura is only in front of people who are not allowed to look at this particular aura. So a foreigner, a stranger, a person who is not mahram to you should cover up completely, entirely before him. But before, other than that, your maharim, the aura will be limited to certain parts. A woman is breastfeeding at her house before another woman, before uh, 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 one of, before her husband, it's okay. This is not only the hair. Now she's exposing her breast. That is perfectly fine. It will not prevent the angels from entering the house. Oh, okay. okay. And my third question is uh, regarding hello. Yeah, I hear you. Regarding my, uh, regarding talaq, uh, if a man pronounces all the three talaq at once in one event, is it considered as a final three talaq, or is it considered to be only one? Okay. Okay, thank you so much. That's only uh, two questions. You say three. Yes, can I say Hazrat Allah Naimal Wakil in ah, my Ah, okay. Jazakallah khair. Okay. I'm sorry. I have to record because when I get a backlog, sometimes I uh, I forget. Uh, Ahmed from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum. Naam, Ahmed. 
yes, uh, Sheikh, I have two questions. Inshallah, I'll try to make them as simple as possible. Yeah. Uh, first one is, uh, what determines a Muslim country from a non-Muslim country? Mm -hmm. And can you please provide the lead from classical scholars or other such authentic sources? Okay. And second question is, is it allowed to go for tourism? And by tourism, I mean by sightseeing and stuff like that to other countries. Okay. And the third question is about the hadith, which I want to verify if it's a he or not. It is as follows. The greatest jihad is to battle your own soul, to fight the evil within yourself. These are my three questions. Okay. Okay, what is that, Brother Ahmed? Ummu Aman from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Askuda. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. No. Uh, I have uh, three questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, when we make the Sunnah Salah. Uh, do we have to change the positions if you are making the fard? Is there, is there any authenticity in that? Okay. That we need to change the places. Uh, and the other thing is like uh, when you pray the sunnah prayer, like even in the masjid, like if you go, do we have to change places every day? Like if you are going for a visit for your studies or something in the masjid, uh, one sister told me that change your places that, uh, you know, you will get the reward that uh, each place will give you witness that you prayed in these particular places. Is okay. there any authenticity Basically, Ummu Aman, the two questions are relating to each other. As yes, far as yes, the first yes, one, most, most Muslims are unaware of this fact. That's why we see it's very common in the masjid in Jama'ah. People, once they finish the fard namaz, they get up right away to pray the sunnah. This is an innovation. And this is a prohibited practice because the Prophet ﷺ ordered not to get up right after the fard to pray the sunnah, unless if you separate between them by sayings, actions, or moving from one place to another. Why? To block the means of resembling the sunnah to the fard. Of resembling the sunnah to the fard. So you have okay. to separate between the fard, the namaz, whether you're praying in the masjid, in jama'ah, or at home by yourself, that once you pray the fard, if you sit and you make khitam salah or you cite at al kursi and the tasbih, that's sufficient separation. Then you can get up to praise the sunnah. If you pray the fard, you are on a hurry, you get up and you move from one place to another, that's a separation. Talk to somebody else or make anything that indicates this is a separate prayer that is valid. And uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on him, used to like to pray the sunnah in a different place. Why? Because there are indications or athar that every spot that you prostrate against, you put your forehead and nose on the floor, that will bear witness for you on the Day of Judgment. It will bear witness for you on the Day of Judgment. You prayed here and you prayed there. That's why it's highly recommended also whenever you travel to different countries, even if there is no uh, fard due right now, you're passing by a town, offer a prayer, sunnah. I mean, it is not sunnah to do so, but each place that you put your forehead and nose against and you make sujood on will witness for you on the Day of Judgment. Okay, Umm Aman, Barakallahu uh, Sheikh, there's another question. Now. Uh, that is like um, my husband does not agree me wearing the niqab, but I do so whenever I'm not with him. And now I have restricted going out with him because of this matter. Mm. So what I'm doing right now is a uh, is little bit harming our relationship. So I feel that, uh, can you advise me, Sheikh, that uh, which act is more greater? I think I know it is obedience to Allah is the uh, first thing. But uh, then, um, as a sheikh, um, like you know, I would like to have. No, I mean, some I understand. It, on this. I understand that you're calling from United Arab Emirates. So you're calling yes. from a, a country where vast majority are Muslims, yes. and there are a lot of people who are wearing niqab. So yes, if I you do. are wearing niqab and going out with your husband, whether shopping or dining or whatever, yes. 
he shouldn't be ashamed. He shouldn't be afraid or worried. I hope he's listening to me right now. A person yes. who, whose wife is asking him to be modest, to cover up before everybody, but not him, of course, and uh, to protect her modesty and chastity, or at least to copy and imitate the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, the lady companions should be proud of that. Should really bow down in sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a mean of gratitude. Such the chuk, because his wife desires to do something that Allah and his messenger ﷺ loves. That if we take the other opinion which says that niqab is not mandatory and it is mere recommended. So when somebody has his wife asking him, I would like to wear niqab, he should celebrate that. He should be delighted, not the other way around. I hope he gets this message. And at home you're all his. So why not allow you to cover up your face or wear the niqab uh, to be like the mothers of the believers? Because the two different opinions, one which says it's a fard, and the other one says it's recommended. So if I want to do something recommended, why do you want me to show my face to others? Barakallahu feek. Melam from the case, eh? Rabbi Melam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Where are you from originally, Melam? Uh, I am, I am, uh, all, um, exactly, I am not from the uh, case, I am, I am from the Czech Republic. I am from Czech Republic. Just okay. now I am, uh, uh, I am here, I am studying. Uh, Sheikh. Is Milan your original name? My name is Milan, uh, like the, like town in the Italy, <laughs> Milan. Okay, I got it. Okay, what's your question, Milan? Uh, please, I have this question, uh, Sheikh uh, Saleh. In the case of divorce, who takes care of it? Is it different for girls and boys? It's first. My, it's my first question. Okay, wait a minute, Milan. You're talking um, about uh, the taking care of parents? Uh, take, who takes care of kids? Kids. Kids. Okay. Then I believe you're talking about the custody. Yes, 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 custody. Yeah. In case of separation. Yes, yes, really. Okay. Next question. Next question. If a divorce is done and the women, woman observed her waiting period, can she marry a different man than her husband if kids from the first marriage stayed with her? Okay. And uh, my uh, next question, excuse me please so much. Who is taking care of girls if they can't be in a mother's or grandmother's care after divorce. Okay, that is similar to the first question. They are relating to each other. So I will explain that all, inshallah, Azza Jal. In the same order, I got your question. Okay. Any other questions, Milan? Okay, Barakallah Feek. Thank you so much. Fatima from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Fatima. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Uh, Sheikh, I have one long question. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, uh, I'm due to pay zakah. And uh, like last year, my husband paid it on behalf of me. This year, we have invested all our money in going to Hajj. So we are literally out of cash. Uh, I have ornaments with me. So I would like to sell a piece of ornament in order to pay the zakah. So my question is, uh, for example, if I'm due to pay for 30 grams of gold, each year what we do is uh, we find out the rate of the current uh, 1 gram gold and give it for that 30 gram. So now if I go and sell a piece of ornament, which is old gold, they are not going to give me the money for the current, uh, which is equivalent to the current gold. So if I, may, if I sell an ornament for 30 grams, I may only get the money uh, of 28 grams according to the current rate. 
So should I sell more so that I meet the requirement of the uh, current day goal amount? Okay, Fa Fatima, you mentioned earlier you do to pay the cash. Yes. Meanwhile, you said you don't have any cash. So yeah, let, me, let me understand from you, or yeah. uh, if you please explain to me, what kind of positions which you believe that it should be zakatable? I have ornaments, gold ornaments, uh, uh, for which I need to pay zakat. Okay, is it more than 85 yes, grams yes. of gold? Yes, uh, I am giving you the example of like, I need to pay zakat for about 30 grams or 35 grams of gold. I see. So, uh, and I would not like to give just one piece of ornament to one person. I would like to distribute it among a lot of relatives of mine. So you want to sell it? Yes, I want to sell it and cash it up. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. What did you say, uh, Sheikh? Yeah, I got your question. You want to sell it, collect the yes. cash, and distribute it. Yes, but I want to know what, like, for example, if I'm due to pay 30 grams, how much, should I meet the current gold rate? Exactly. Or the market rate? Or yeah, 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 yeah. What, what okay you need to do, <laughs> listen yeah. to me, Fatima, okay? Yeah. I'm going to help you out. Let's say that you have 200 gram, 300 gram, or 1,000, 1 kilogram of gold, okay? The value will be the market value. If you were to sell this gold right now, how much will you collect, okay? So... You estimate this, if you are selling the gold right now, how much is it worth? And you take 2.5% out of this value, out of this cash. Okay. So you cash an equivalent amount or an equivalent weight, grams of gold, yeah. to the amount of cash which you're supposed to pay out as a cash. Okay. okay? Barakallahu okay. feek. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. welcome. Mustafa from USA. Assalamu alaikum, Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, uh, Sheikh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Jazakallah khair. Um, Sheikh, I have a couple of questions in regard to Hajj. Uh, just need some clarifications. Uh, I've been reading a couple of books and listening to some imams here, but just in regard to Tawaf al wada that's mm. the first question. Uh, in this situation, in my understanding, Tawaf al wada is supposed to be done uh, when you intend to leave Mecca. And correct me if I'm wrong. Now. Yeah. Right? Correct. So, uh, no. so, in the case, for example, um, you finish all the Hajj rituals and the only thing left is Tawaf al Wada, and you're planning on staying in Mecca for a couple more days, but within those days, you're planning on leaving Mecca to Jeddah for a visit, let's say you're visiting someone, and going back to Mecca to, uh, uh, <coughs> for, let's say, a couple more days before you leave. Saudi Arabia. So what is the best time to perform Tawaf al in, in that situation? Um, my second question um, uh, is, is again, when you have the intention to, when you, uh, the intention to have Hajj Tamatur, you're coming from Medina, intend to do Umrah first, then Hajj. Now, uh, after the Sai, uh, we're supposed to, uh, you know, shave our hair. Now, <laughs> I've written a, a little book that you can actually shorten it because the intent is the hash. Mm -hmm. You give the shaving into the hash. Mm -hmm. You can clarify that for me, what is the best way? Because I usually want to do shaving, but uh, you only have a few days. I don't know how much hair you can grow in a few days. To Not shave. much. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if you can clarify what's the best way. Today, okay. And Quickly, because, you know, the single that we have before we take the, the break, and I... Uh, I request the brothers who ask questions before you to, be, to bear patiently with me because I was supposed to answer the questions in the same order they were received. Uh, wada means goodbye, farewell. And it is relating to the nusuk, to the act of worship of hajj, not the umrah. Okay. So if you are leaving Mecca today and you're not coming back, you better do tawaf al wada a couple hours before your departure. And I said couple hours to allow yourself to really get to do the tawaf, because sometimes if you have a bus waiting or a group, allow yourself some time to perform tawaf al wada. It's very crowded. It may take several hours. Okay. If you're going to visit relatives in Jeddah and coming back to Mecca, then you're not obliged to do tawaf al wada because you're still in the nusuk. You can come and you can go and come back. Then, whenever you're leaving, finally perform tawaf al wada. If you're going, if you're leaving and 
you're gonna stay for some time and Jada can perform tawaf al wada then you finished all the nusuk including tawaf al wada and if you happen to return back to Mecca you either return back with a new uh, ihram for Umrah you're allowed to do so or if you're coming for a business then you don't have to do Umrah uh, as far as shaving or trimming since the, the gap or the span between the Umrah and the Hajj is only a couple days it will be recommended to trim not to shave because by the time you perform uh, 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 you perform uh, Arafah you perform the, the, the main pillar of Hajj which is Arafah and then you return on the 10th day which is Yawm al -Nah, and you're ready to shave it will be hard to grow some hair back so saving some hair to be shaved on Hajj is, is a smart idea okay Every, uh, brother inshallah let's take a short break Inshallah, I'll be back in a couple of minutes, so stay tuned. دينك وكتابك وسنة نبيك وعبادك الموحدين. The Prophet Muhammad taught me how to be kind. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم taught me the importance of seeking knowledge. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him taught me how to respect and be kind to my parents. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him taught me how to make da'wah for Muslims and non-Muslims. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught me how to be kind to my parents. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, taught me how to have mercy for mankind. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught me that I do to others what I wish done to myself. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught me how to respect women. اللهم انصر دينك وكتابك وسنة نبيك وعبادك الموحدين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back we have a few questions pending from the previous segment Um Munada uh, the first question she has is saying, Hasbi Allah wa ni'm al wakil. Sufficient indeed is Allah for me, and He's the best disposer of all my affairs. To say that in sujood, that's fine. Hasbi Allah wa ni'm al wakil is a beautiful invocation. It has been said by Ibrahim alayhi salam when he was about to be thrown in fire, and it was said by the Prophet and his companions uh, during the Battle of the Confederates and the Battle of. Uh, Uhud and Allah suffice for them. So it is a great invocation. You can say it in your sujood. Okay? But to say, I say it in a certain number of times in certain sujood requires a reference. And we don't have a reference to that. So you say it occasionally, you say it whenever you remember, you say it with other uh, means of uh, dua or invocations is fine. Uh, giving divorce three times at once. We ask the husband who consumed all his rights at once because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said At-talaqu marratan fa'imsakum bima'rufin aw tasrihum bi'ihsan You may divorce your wife whenever it is the last resort and it is the ultimate solution twice one then after the idda is over if you want to divorce her again then another time and she shouldn't be in her period and she shouldn't be in the tuhr that follows the period after you had a sexual relation with her. Or otherwise it will be considered as a bid'ah. Okay. So if the person meant to say, Antu talik, 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 we divorce, 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 to confirm that he really means that she's divorced, that counts as one. But if he meant, I would like to consume all my chances of divorcing you, not to have you as a wife furthermore, then according to the vast majority of the scholars, that counts as irreversible, irrevocable divorce. He's, he has consumed 
all allowed times of divorce. فإن طلقها فلا تحل له من بعد حتى تنكح زوجا غيره. He really got himself in a big trouble because if he wanted to resume the marriage life and he intended to divorce her uh, the three times, he doesn't have the right unless if she marries somebody else and so on. And this is the opinion of Al Jumhur. One has to watch what he says. One has not to be pushed to the edge, whether by his wife or by anybody else. Because sometimes the wife says, okay, divorce me. I want to divorce right now. That's why Allah gave the power of divorce to the man. If the wife keeps telling her husband, you're divorced all day long, it doesn't count as divorce. Only when she pushes him to the edge and she says, if you're a man, divorce me. He says, okay, you're divorced. Did it count as divorce? Then once again, she says, okay, divorce me again. And he says, you're divorced. You're divorced. And he knows that he's divorcing his wife, not his mother, not his sister, not his daughter. Then he's fully aware that he's divorcing his wife. Then that counts as three times divorce. May Allah protect us. Uh, Ahmed from uh, Qatar, what is considered a Muslim country and what's considered a non-Muslim country? A Muslim country is a country that declares Islam as the religion of this country. You may see a country which claims that we are a Muslim country, they have masajid and according to their constitution or by law, Islam is the official religion of the country but most people are not practicing Islam, but it is still officially a Muslim country. Why is it official? We're talking about rules and regulations pertaining peace and war. We're talking about making allies with these countries. We're talking about this country is a Muslim country or not a Muslim country. Can I still live in this country or I have to make hijrah? A Muslim country is a country in which people, in addition to declaring Islam as an official religion, can freely practice their ibadat. Uh, sometimes, some countries claim to be Muslim countries where the vast majority of the population, 95%, were not allowed to pray in the masajid, were not allowed to grow their beers for men, women are not allowed to wear hijab, so they are being oppressed, but it doesn't mean that the country is not a Muslim country. Vast majority are Muslims. They love Islam. Look what happened in Tunisia. The Tunisian president, may Allah punish him with what he deserves. He's still alive and he's hiding somewhere, as you all know. This guy, a couple of years ago, he banned Tunisians from performing Hajj. Now he's only one hour or 45 minutes away from Mecca. But he cannot perform Hajj. Subhanallah. Look at the punishment. He, during his regime, youth could not go to the masajid. You go to the masajid, you will be arrested. I personally have witnessed things like that. I prayed in one masjid in Egypt where if the youth will go to Fajr prayer, they will be arrested. And I have seen that by my own eyes. It doesn't mean that the country is not a Muslim country. People are trying, are struggling. And by the leave of Allah, with patience and struggle, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave us in many countries relief. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make those Muslim countries now apply the Sharia. So not applying the Sharia would not make them non-Muslim countries. Unless if they deny the Sharia and they say it's insignificant, we don't want it and we prefer some other Sharia. But the intention and the heart and the emotions of the vast majority of people of these Muslim countries are with the Sharia. It is only that the regimes or oppressing regimes or whatever are not allowing them. And a non-Muslim country is a country that declares any religion as their official religion or vast majority of its uh, uh, citizens uh, are non-Muslims of various sects or various religions and Muslims are minority they can barely offer their acts of worship freely. And whether they are oppressed or not, still it's not a Muslim country. In France, women are not allowed to wear hijab. Uh, in, 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 in many countries, I ha just have another question right now in New Zealand. They are uh, thinking about banning hijab in the streets. Okay, so these are not Muslim countries, of course. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um Hana from KSA. 
السلام عليكم شيخ وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته I have just one question نعم uh, My daughter is a medical first year medical student in Riyadh نعم and she has to do dissection of cadavers in her first year mm -hmm. So she was wondering if this is halal in Islam You're talking about is, as a body is considered as an amana mm -hmm. So is it halal? I just I, want I, to I clarify the, I thought they quit doing anatomy on uh, 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 corpse of human beings Yes. Are they still doing so? On real human beings or on uh, artificial skeletons? Can you can you answer uh, this? No, real real dead bodies. Yeah. Real dead bodies. Okay. Yes. Nah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Barakallah. Abdullah from Cybers. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Nah. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to in the masjid. Okay, I guess you're talking about Tahiyatul Masjid, but I didn't get the full question. Please try again. Tourism. To travel to tourist places and visit them is permissible with one condition. What are you traveling to? What are you going to see there? Okay. We've been over this past weekend in a very, very special city, which is called Shamashek, but for da'wa purposes. Not a single time in, in my life I thought of visiting this city. We were banned from visiting this city. It was exclusively for the tyrant pharaoh. But now, once we landed there with a group of my colleagues and shiuch, we were warm welcomed and uh, we gave speeches everywhere. Everybody was very happy. So they asked us, okay, let's go for scuba diving or for take a submarine to watch the wonders of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the coral and the reef and so on. We put a condition. Initially, we said no, because we were afraid that we will have to see on the way women wearing bikinis and uh, in the nude because these places are like for that. So they assured us we will take a private submarine just for us. And they evacuated the whole one for a group of us. We did not lay our eyes on anything that is prohibited, alhamdulillah. But we kept making dhik in the submarine watching the beautiful creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us we were just busy with saying, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah, Allahu Akbar. And each one of us was reciting an ayah that suits the situation. This is the creation of Allah, so show me your creation. Everyone was, you know, reflecting on an ayah and so on. So these places, if you avoid the violations, if you know that you're not going to be seeing anything like that, it is okay. In some of the uh, uh, Gulf countries, they have private beaches uh, where you can take your family and you feel uh, some privacy. So it is okay. But if you know that you're going to a beach where there is free mixing and women who are not wearing or dressed up properly, and men, because normally when you speak about hijab, we're only speaking about women. Men too have some kind of hijab. They have to cover between the navel and the knees. This is the hijab that they have to wear. So wearing the speedos or short shorts because they're going swimming is a aura. You cannot see the aura of a man, whether a man seeing the aura of another man or a woman seeing the aura of uh, another man. Okay? But, uh, you know, for instance, going to Niagara Falls, if you are living in America and going to these places, is okay. Seeing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, praising Allah for what he has created is permissible. Going to Alaska, going to the mountains, going to uh, uh, hiking, fishing, uh, 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 camping, as long as you know that you will not be confronted with uh, nudity and uh, seeing the aura of other people, uh, drinking or anything like that, like going for a cruise. I love to have a halal cruise one day. Why am I not going on a cruise? Because you all know that on the roof, people are like dead fish in the nude, getting tanned. What if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes those people for what they're doing right now and you happen to be in the lower deck? What happens? What put you in this place? So one has to choose for himself 
the right place because the Prophet ﷺ was passing by the homes of Thamud, the people of Prophet Salih, and he ordered his companions to rush and he was lowering his head. They said, why? He said, this is what Allah has punished the people of Prophet Salih. And you never know if Allah intends to punish them again and you will be amongst them. Hurry. Okay? You do not put yourself in a situation where you know that vast majority of people are involved in sins. There are a lot of halal fun. Because we don't have time, uh, I won't go through it furthermore. Otherwise, really, as dua, as Muslims, we enjoy our lives. We have a lot of fun beyond what many people think. Beyond what the people who are enjoying the haram think that we enjoy more than them. The halal is available everywhere by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as the hadith that he mentioned, uh, al-jihad al-akbar or the major jihad, this hadith is a munkar hadith, is collected by a dilemma. Very, very common. You find the dua particularly in America. When they speak about jihad, they're trying to give jihad a different definition. So they say jihad uh, on the battlefield is nothing. The real jihad is to struggle against your inner desire, and here is the proof. This hadith is the most frequently quoted hadith in the interface dialogue, and it is fake. Fake, fake. It says, رَجَعْنَا مِنَ الْجِهَادِ الْأَصْغَرِ إِلَى الْجِهَادِ الْأَكْبَرِ and it says that the Prophet ﷺ said upon returning from the conquest of Mecca, we just finished the minor jihad and now we spare ourselves for the major jihad which is uh, struggling against uh, uh, our inner desire. In fact, struggling against one's inner desire and one's uh, inner self is a struggle, is one of the source of jihad. But this hadith is not correct and it's not a hadith. As I said, it's judged by the Shaykh al-Albani, may Allah have mercy on him, as munkar, extremely weak uh, as well. Barakallahu feekum, may Allah guide us what's best. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullahi li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate